Hi guys, it's Andy from Man City Fan TV and welcome to episode 10 uh, of the podcast series. And I've got two more guests with me tonight. Uh, one, you'll recognise his voice. He was a contributor on the 125th anniversary documentary and that is Chris. How are you doing, buddy? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, mate, and everyone else out listening. Great. Have you had a good one? Uh, I've been at work a bit of it, Andy, but uh, yeah, not bad. No fights, fairly peaceful. <laughs> It's been a success, mate. Brilliant. And uh, our other guest tonight is Tom, who you might recognise from some of the fan cams at the game. So, Tom, happy new, happy new year to you, mate. Hope you're well. Happy New Year, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. No anyway, uh, we're just going to set out what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. And uh, we're going to review the Christmas fixtures because uh, it's, it's just been one after the other after the other. We're not going to go all the way back, uh, but we'll go back to the the City uh, 3-1 win uh, against Leicester. Obviously, prior to that, uh, there was the 3-0 victory uh, away uh, at the Emirates Stadium. But we'll go back to the Leicester game. Uh, we're going to review quickly that game, review the Wolves game, uh, which was a bit of a disappointment. Obviously, we had the Sheffield United 2-0 and then obviously yesterday's 2-1 win against Everton. We're also then going to look at uh, any potential signings that you might think uh, need coming in, will come in. Any outgoings in January, it's always a difficult uh, period um, to do really, really good business in um, historically. Uh, we'll take a look at, uh, we'll have a very quick chat about VAR because it seems to be just in the headlines all the time, every single match lately. And then finally, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the City team of the decade. So starting off, um, right, going all the way back to, which seems forever now, uh, which was the Man City versus Leicester game, 3-1. We know that Mares uh, scored, Ilkay Gundogan scored, and Gabby Jesus. Obviously, Jamie Vardy gave them the lead. So, Tom, you're, you're up first, mate. What were your yeah. thoughts on that particular game? Well, I did think it was quite a slow start to the game. Um, Leicester dominated the first 25 minutes, and they obviously they got the goal in that space of time. It was, it was sort of like the United game, in a way, where we didn't really seem to be handling the counter-attacks that well. Vardy had a few chances, but as soon as we went 1-0 down, the, the head sort of turned, sort of, if you could say that, and we just, literally just pulled out the bag and then somehow got two really quick goals, Mares and um, who was the other one scored? Gundogan. Gundogan. Gundogan's penalty. Yeah, Gundogan's penalty, and then we were 2-1 up at half-time, and then ever, ever from that point, we were on it, and it was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the... Um... I was quite surprised because going into that game, I was thinking, this is going to be a seriously tough mm. game. Possession stats-wise, City 62.7% against 37.3. We had 12 shots on target to their two. Uh, we had 23 shots compared to their five. And 800 and, uh, 859 touches, 690 passes. So, Chris, what were your thoughts going into that game? Because, let's face it, um, Leicester were and still are uh, ahead of Man City. Yeah, going into the game, I was a bit worried uh, with Vardy and, uh, you know, the way they attacked through him and our weaknesses at the minute seem to be uh, playing into their hands. But I, I thought we played really well in the, in the game. Uh, probably one of the better games of the season. Yeah. Coming off coming off that Arsenal result as well, it looked like we were actually getting on to a run. And, uh, I think on the radio I heard we haven't won three league games in a row so uh, this season. So... Uh, it's like, yeah, that's decent and we should, you know, I know Wolves were going to be a tough game, but I thought, you know, this could be a chance for us to, I don't think we've got any chance to win the league, but a good chance to get above Leicester and uh, keep on going, you know, and have a strong finish the season. I thought we played, I, play, I think we played a really good brand of football that day. I think that's a, that's a really interesting stat you've just pulled out. One I didn't know, actually, that we, we hadn't won three on, on the bounce, I mean, I've just, I'm just looking at the um, the games and obviously we started up the season 5-0 against West Ham, but then we drew against Spurs. We beat Bournemouth away, 3-1. We then beat Brighton, 4-0. But on our third game there, where we could have had three on the spin, we got beat to Norwich, 3-2. We then battered at Watford, 8-0. Everton, 3-1. Um, uh, then we got beat by Wolves. We beat Palace away. We beat Villa at home. 
We beat Southampton at home. We got beat by Liverpool. Uh, we beat Chelsea. Then we went and drew with Newcastle. Beat Burnley away. Then got beat by United. And then, of course, beat Arsenal and on to this game, which we talk about now, which is Leicester. So that is, that, that's unusual, isn't it, for Man City? Well, it is of recent times. It definitely is, yeah. It definitely is. <laughs> so, 3 yeah. 1. Great result. I mean, it was. A, I mean, I remember walking away from the game thinking, you know, that's a that's a good three points uh, because uh, Leicester at that point were flying. Definitely, point. definitely, and and I think coming off the back of the Arsenal game as well, because we played really well down there. You know, I thought this. You know, maybe the maybe the you know the tides turning. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a question to you, Tom. Yeah. Well, we beat Leicester three one, and if you remember rightly, this is this is all conspiracy theories. But Leicester then played Liverpool next, yes, and, and dropped three or four of their key players. Yeah, <laughs> you <know>? exactly. <laughs> which, moves, which moves us on to the next game, which is Wolves um, three and Man City two um, two nil up in that game, uh, and ironically, the next game Wolves played Liverpool. Uh, and they dropped a lot of players in that particular <laughs> game as well. But anyway, let's just uh, get rid of the conspiracy theories and just move on to the Wolves game, which uh, obviously was away. Uh, couldn't have got off to a worse start. Edison, what were your thoughts on that, Tom? Well, as soon as Edison made that foul, it was always going to it was always going to be tough anyway. Out of the all the fixtures over the Christmas period, that was the one that was going to be the toughest. Obviously, they'd beaten us at our place, so it was time for a bit of revenge, if you want to call it like that. Um, so after his, it was a silly decision for him running out that fast so early on in the game. Um, but as soon as as soon as he did make the foul, I thought yeah, to get three points out of this is going to be a miracle at this point. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what your thought. I've still watched it back that many times, and I still say that Jota puts his elbow into uh, yeah. into Edison to force the for him to roll over and get a foul. I mean, should Edison been out that far? I mean, how many times does he come out and clear the ball that far out? He's done it loads of times, mm. but this time, this time it cost us, Chris, didn't it? You know, and yeah. 12, minutes, twelve minutes in, we're down to ten men. Uh, it was an error of judgment, wasn't it, on his behalf? Yeah. I think you're right, Andy. That you know, it was. I, you can see why Atkinson sent him off, mm. and then I, I don't know if VAR looked at it and decided it wasn't a clear and obvious mistake uh, by the ref. Um, he just it was one of those. I expected him to go as soon as he uh, touched him. So yeah, I, I mean, I, as soon as I saw it, I thought that's it, he's off. Yeah. But then when I watched it back numerous times, I, I thought, you know, but uh, it's one of those. I mean, yeah. if he mm. stayed on the pitch, Wolves fans would have been up in arms and. Vice versa, but ten well, we men... played well, didn't we? For if the rest of that really, first half, really, yeah. Played well, I mean, we, we, you know, we got the goal through Raheem Sterling, uh, yeah. twenty fifth minute, uh, and we went in sort of one nil up at half time, thinking, oh, oh, you know what, we played decent here, considering. Um, I don't think we should uh, hide the fact that you know that goal by Raheem was after you know a second penalty that was saved and. It's the quite, I really don't understand why Raheem's taking penalties. No. I, I don't get that. You just had to look at the uh, reaction of Pep and the, the coaching staff after he put the rebound in. They weren't celebrating. They were angry at the fact that it took that many attempts to get it in the net. Yeah, and I think that if De Bruyne is on the pitch, you know, surely he's got to be the guy taking it, unless Gundogan's playing because he's a, mm. he is a great penalty taker. Yeah. I, I still don't know why Kevin De Bruyne, who is probably the best passer in world football, if he can't if he can't stroke it in from the penalty spot <laughs> uh, into exactly where he wants it, yeah, yeah, I find it amazing. But maybe he's just not confident taking penalties. But we go we go two 0 up, and we're thinking, you know, Raheem again, and, and a, a wonderful finish, a little right. dink over uh, over mm -hmm. their keeper. I think he's hold on a minute. We're ten, you know, we, we've been down to ten men from twelve minutes in. Raz has got two goals. We're two 0 up away at Wolves, who were flying at the time. Yeah. And then what happened next? <laughs> and that was, that was a really good goal, wasn't it? From you know, it was a lovely oh. move, great pass by Rodri to KDB, who played a you know that first time pass. 
and a great finish from Sterling. Who I thought I had a ball. It was De Bruyne one two who played the ball through. I think it was De Bruyne one two who played. The I think ball Rod- yeah, Rodri two De Bruyne two and then De Bruyne, yeah, and then and he slipped it through, didn't he? And I, I thought Sterling had a pretty poor match, but you know he took that goal really well. And then afterwards, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, I, 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 when we were getting set up for this today, it, right, the whole thing reminded me of like a Christmas Carol. You know, it was the go- <laughs> that game was the ghost of Christmas past. You know, yeah. through throwing away a two goal lead, the manager making some horrible decisions. He looked nervous and edgy, uh, but it was a bit of a glimpse of the old uh, typical city. You know, it was. I mean, it, it looked like. Um... The way that he sort of threw the five at the back together and he just was thinking, God, we're just inviting them on. Um, I don't know what your thoughts were, Tom. Well, personally, I thought when he took Aguero off in the first half, that's when he made the error. Um, Personally, I think we should have been three or four nil up at that point. So it's just a case of, Obviously, the defence situation at the moment as well. You know, it's just it's just trying to get through games as well as we can. You know, we went 82 minutes with 10 men. I yeah. think it was just a lack of uh, concentration and fatigue that made the result go from good to bad. And, I think Aguero was the right person to bring off in that circumstance because he's only just coming back from injury. To expect him to run round for... Was it, Okay, was it twelfth minute that he got sent 12, off? 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to um, to ask Aguero to run around like you know, like and he's not that sort of player anyway. No. I can I thought that wasn't a bad decision. I didn't really have a problem with Mares uh, for G- Garcia, but I did have a problem with the uh, Kevin De Bruyne uh, substitution. I thought he was just getting into the game. That not long after the second goal. Sterling picked the ball up when we were breaking and he should have played a, a fairly simple ball to De Bruyne who either would have gone on to, to all, well, he would have made it to the penalty box and we could have squared it back for Sterling. But it was a crap pass by Sterling yeah. and then and then he got hooked and brought on now and brought on De Gundogan. And it wasn't Gundogan's kind of a match, you know. It was bring on Foden, someone who can run around, someone with, with legs because I think you're right, we were getting tired. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think his intention was to even start Aguero because, if I remember yeah. rightly, Gabby should have been starting, but there was then ill at the last yeah. minute. Yeah. So I don't, I don't even think he was, he would possibly wanted to start Aguero anyway. No. And when that happened, I just thought he's thinking, I, I really don't want him on the pitch. I'm sure we can do without him. But uh, yeah, it was, you know, you can't believe it. After 50 minutes, we're two 0 up. Um, played uh, since the 12th minute with 10 men. Uh, but then you look at the statistics, the match stats, the possession. Yeah. Um, we only had 38.1% possession uh, compared to their 61.9, which, albeit, yes, with 10 men. But even a City team, uh, normally you'd expect with 10 men, us to keep the ball a hell of a lot better. But we didn't. We just invited them on time and time again. And then, of course, we got Triori's goal, which I think he took really well. Yeah. Uh, Good goal. Then... Then Benjamin Mendy, <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what he was doing, but I thought up to that point, he kept Traore pretty quiet most most of the game because he is a mm. dangerous player. Uh, but what were your thoughts on Mendy? Uh, uh, well, you know, it's a, it is a season for gifting, Andy. So uh, okay. he, he wrapped it up with a bow for him. So, uh, yeah, a real bad mistake by uh, Mendy, who, who had a decent game, actually, up to that point. He did. Yeah. Um, I think if he might have gone over, he might have got a foul because it was a you know, it was a strong challenge to take the ball off him. But you can't blame Traore. He did you know he did he didn't give up on it and uh, squared the ball across. It, it was a bad mistake by Mendy, and unfortunately for for Mendy is that he is capable of making those sort of errors. You know, and I want him to do well, Andy, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm still not convinced by him. Well, it was sort of reminiscent of Gary Neville, wasn't it, and Sean Gibbs? Yeah, 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 it was, yeah. But, uh, yeah, and then 2-2, for me, only looked like there was going to be one winner. Uh, they, they were just on the attack after attack after attack. And Matt Doherty steps up, 89th minute, uh, makes it 3-2. And it was just one of those, how, how have we lost this game? But it is what it is. Uh, and Wolves are a decent team and, and you know, 
to go there with 10 men would always be difficult, but uh, I just thought we, we missed out on an opportunity, especially 2-0 up. If that would have been a 3-1 comfortable win for Wolves, you could sort of go, fine, fair enough. But the fact we were 2-0 up, yeah. it was, we looked tired. We looked really, really tired. And uh, a couple of days later, well, less than two days later, I think 46 hours later, <laughs> we're on to uh, Sheffield United. So uh, what were your thoughts, uh, for the Sheffield United game, Tom, because uh, let's face it, Chris Wilde has done a wonderful job. Uh, we thought it was going to be a really difficult game. In fact, it didn't really mm-hmm. turn out that way. No, well, I spoke to you obviously before, Andy, and I said um, that stat about Sheffield United haven't lost in an away game since the Championship, yeah. which is an unbelievable stat. Yeah. And to be honest, they obviously they've been to Chelsea and they got a point and they, they go to these away grounds and sometimes outplay the teams and obviously we were hoping that they weren't going to get us on the counter attack which in the end they did for their offside goal yeah um overall i thought we played really really well um obviously the possession was back up to where we'd like to i think it was something along the lines of 72% well 72.9% um, so yeah. which is you know massive yeah. against a team that can play yeah. football which is brilliant um obviously it was like as soon as they got that offside goal we sort of realized how good they are on the counter attack and sort of changed the tactics in a way yeah. and um, came out on top then and then obviously got the two goals in the second half. So it was a pretty comfortable game and a lot more, uh, a lot less than I expected from Sheffield United. I thought they were going to bring it to us a little bit more than they did, to be honest. Yes, so did I. What mm. were your thoughts on that, Chris? Obviously, Aguero scored. The Both goals were in the second half. Aguero on 52 and Kevin De Bruyne on 82. Uh, but I think... Uh, if you look at the stats, four shots on target to their zero, 16 shots in total, 871 passes. Uh, it, it, it just seemed a much easier game than I, than I was expecting. Well, you say that, I thought we were fortunate to be level at half-time. Uh, it was a, a very close VAR decision. Another okay. ball another ball over the top for, I forget, I forget the name of the lad, same lad. Um, <clears throat> and he stuck it into the side netting, didn't he? He did. Uh, so they had their chances, and uh, you know, I don't know. It just seems like I say in this trilogy of the Christmas Carol. This was the ghost of Christmas present. You know, it was a a, t- a city. I think is suffering a little bit of an identity crisis. Um, I don't think with a team of the past couple of seasons, you know, a bit wasteful, a bit too predictable, uh, and get, giving up chances and lacking the incision. You know, but the second half we came out, we played a bit better, and you know. We should have too much for a team like Sheffield United, even as well as they've done. Um, you know, and we have got great players in uh, De Bruyne and Aguero. But I think our first goal was we were quite fortunate for it to stand. You know, well, are you talk, you're, you're obviously talking about the point of view that uh, the refer, the referee, or the ball was played, uh, and the referee was it Kavanagh, Chris Kavanagh? I think. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it was Chris Kavanagh. Yeah, I think. I think. <sighs> It's one of those. Into is it unsportingly conduct? Is it? Is it? I don't, I don't think Sick did anything wrong. Don't because think he, he never he never touched the referee, did it? He, t- no. he sort of got in the way of their player, whoever was it, Fleck or whoever it was, because uh, it never touched the ref. Hence, why he didn't stop play. Yeah, uh, it, it basically it made the Fleck was it make a a poor touch on it, and it went yeah. and fell to De Bruyne. And if the referee wasn't in his way, I don't think that would have happened. Yeah, I think I, you would I, I, Yeah, and I think, you know, if that had happened against us, we would have been fuming. But, you know, we need a bit of luck and we got it. It yeah. all evens itself out, so they say. <laughs> yeah. <a> bollocks. <laughs> 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 but anyway, we um talking about, uh, you just mentioned a good point there, uh, Chris, with, with regards to, identity and looking at the team and moving on to yesterday's game um the lineup obviously um it was martin came across martin was filming the coach arriving and he went i haven't seen edison come off that coach and i went what mm. and he went, i haven't seen edison come off that coach seen uh, bravo and scott carson he said but i might have missed him then it came out the news was uh, that uh, uh, he was ill uh, so bravo retained his place and then the way he selected the team, he went obviously for a 
I don't know whether you want to. It's so difficult. A three four two one, a three four three, a three five, whatever, whatever the formation was, because it was very fluid. But he played Rodri, Fernandinho, and Eric Garcia uh, in the back three with Joao Cancelo and Benjamin Mendy uh, playing very, very wide, and then uh, with Ilkay Gundogan as the holder with Kevin De Bruyne. Phil Foden, uh, Maris and Gabby Jesus. So, Tom, what were your thoughts when that was announced yesterday? I was surprised, obviously, because I didn't know at the time that Edison was ill until I got out into like the stand area, and uh, I was like, "Why is he? Why is he? Why is he not playing him?" And all this sort of thing. Um, obviously, he was ill. I was happy to see Garcia return his place because I thought he had a really, really good game against Sheffield United. He didn't look out of his place at all. Mm. Um, I thought Cancelo had a great game. Um, I thought he really played well. So looking at the lineup, I was actually quite confident because it was nice to see that he changed it up a little bit and obviously tried to make a different sort of tactic work because in the past few weeks, some of the tactics he's done haven't really worked. So it was nice to see him mix it up a little bit. Is it, you know, we, we, we sometimes read from certain sections of the fan base where they go, yeah, Pep's great, but he's got no plan B. Was this not a plan B, Chris? Well, that was exactly my point, and it was going to be, you know, that it was something different, you know. And although we didn't, um, I think the first few minutes, the top 20 minutes of the game, we were feeling each other out because yeah. I don't think either team expected the way the others to play. I thought Everton would be far more aggressive in terms of football, and they were aggressive yeah. as, as you know, strong challenge in that. But they, I was really disappointed with Everton. But, yeah, it was... Um, and then we sort of, as we grew it, grew into the game, and we didn't, we didn't like spend as much time around their penalty box as we have at home against other teams at home. But we controlled the game far better. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was like, it wasn't like watching a Pep Guardiola team at all. Um, but I think it really worked. And it, and I'm not saying we should play that every single game we play, but that is definitely an option. And I, I totally agree there with Tom. Uh, Garcia might just have saved his eighty million pounds. You know, he's yeah. a, you know, he look, he looks a decent player. Really, I mean, a good point. I mean, one thing on on the formation. Um, I, I, I was listening to Carlo Ancelotti's post match press conference, and and he claimed that Pep now with this City team has more options, and he and he's using the team from a um, tactical point of view. <laughs> far more and far better than he did at Barcelona and by Munich. That's high praise. Mm, yeah. no, it is. I don't, I don't know if I agree with him, though. I think, mean, like Tom's just said, you know, we seem to have played a certain style of football regularly. We don't usually change it up. You know, no. the last time, last time we, you know, when we went to Spurs last season uh, in the Champions League, you know, we set up a bit defensively in that game. Yeah. But we're not regularly. He doesn't change things regularly. He sort of, you know, it's going to be playing with wingers and, you know, a couple of attacking midfielders. It's it, And usually four at the back, isn't it? So Yeah, um, normally. But may, may, maybe now he's realising, obviously, how much we are missing at Aimer at Laporte um, and realising that we, you know, we we can't keep making these same mistakes. Uh, we've, that's five games, you know, we've, we've lost this season. Yeah. It was, it was, I was shocked when the team came out, I must admit, I was really shocked. But... I thought uh, I thought he got it spot on, and even though the first half wasn't great, and I thought Everton were poor, really, mm, really poor. Really. Um, I thought that it, we, like you say, sort of like we felt our way into the game, and we we looked in control. Um, I agree. I thought Eric Garcia was exceptional, and uh, Fernandinho yesterday for me. I mean, I gave him my man of the match. I thought he was absolutely brilliant. Mm. Um, uh, do you know, Andy? That w I thought he had a flawless display yesterday. Oh, he was yeah. absolutely, he was absolutely immense. His tackling, his yeah. reading of the game. I mean, if Eric Garcia and I know, I know people will go, Fernandino should be back in his normal position. I get all that. I do yeah. get it. But if he, if Vincent Company's not there, if he wants to learn from anybody about and Eric Garcia's positional play is generally pretty decent. Yeah. Well, I mean. Fernandinho was talking him through that game yesterday, non-stop in his ear mm. all the time. Yeah. I mean, what a player to learn off. And you've got to bear in mind, this has probably been one of the best central defensive midfielders in world football for the last few years. Now he's, now he's a centre-back. 
Uh, he's just fantastic. He reminds me very much of Mascherano at Barcelona. Yeah. You know yeah. that of you know being he's not the tallest, but he wins headers and his yeah. just reading of the game was phenomenal yesterday. I thought I agree with you, uh, Chris. I thought Cancelo had his best game in a City shirt for me yesterday. I thought he did really really well. Likewise, I thought Mendy played well. Um, yeah. There's two two wide uh, areas, but into sort of the second half. We uh, we finally got the breakthrough because I think everyone was sort of thinking, oh, nil, nil. What if they we make a cock up and it's one nil? It's going to be tough. But uh, Gabby Jesus, what were your thoughts on him, Tom, yesterday? Got two goals, one on 51, one on 58. Well, in the past, I've said that Jesus isn't capable to be playing against the bigger teams because if you look at his stats and the majority of his goals do come against the lower league sides, i.e. He got a few against uh, Burton last season and etc. It was nice to see him uh, step up for one of the big games because I know there's a lot of people saying, oh, he won't fill Aguero's boots and this and that. But I think he just needs a little bit more time in the in the squad against the bigger teams to get the goals. So I was, I was happy with his performance yesterday. I thought it was a little glimpse of what he could do in the future, definitely. Great first goal, wasn't it, Chris? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah fantastic. Um he, he, you wouldn't want him to have this long run of games to see yeah. how good he could be, but then you don't want Aguero exactly. to be injured either. Do you? It's a, you it's a catch. Seen, don't you? Yeah, 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 exactly. But he should have scored two more, right? And uh, I yeah. thought the one which he hit the post with, he snatched at it. I thought, yeah, you know, yeah. I, you know, he scored two really good goals, and I thought, you know, and the Go header, the header as well. Yeah. You know, Cancelo cross. He should have, he should have had at least one more. So, you know, a bit like Aguero again, who, who will uh, score two and miss two, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah, it, really good performance on Gabby. And, you know, I hope he can I hope he can just progress to the next step again. You know, he, he might be a player. And some of our, you know, like Foden yesterday, he didn't, Foden wasn't exceptional yesterday, but he gets about that pitch. Yeah. He's a hard worker. He's, he's you know, he should have had a penalty, you know. <clears throat> This, I, I, you know, now the league is over. Uh, unless Liverpool capitulate, and that ain't going to happen. Let's give the youth a go, you know. Let them play in the big games, you know. And and instead of using the cup competitions to plug players, let's use them in the league. Mm. Well, I mean, you only have to look at the table, top four now. Um, the chances <laughs> of dropping out. The, we'd we'd have to have a massive free fall for us to drop out the top four. So. The top four keeps us in the Champions League. Well, depending on what happens, but uh, the uh, yeah, I agree. We, we've got the likes of Howard Bellis, uh, who I, I don't think has ever put a foot wrong when he's played in a city first team shirt. I think he's been absolutely <laughs> superb. Um, and we've got others, the likes of Tommy Doyle, um, who, who, who might be given a chance in the future. But you know, cruising at two nil, we uh, we then see. Claudio do a lovely little cry turn. The crowd are on the feet cheering. He passes it out a little bit short. It wasn't like the shot came from the edge of the area. Moise Keane still had to beat two City players who didn't put a tackle in and then get a deflected shot across and Richarlison scores on 71. What were your thoughts on that, Tom? Well, to, up to that point, I thought Bravo was playing really well. Obviously, that yeah. first half save from Richarlison, that was world class. It was yeah. going right into the opposite corner. Uh, I just, I just think it was a bit of lack of confidence, really. I think a bit off the boil, really, because obviously that second half, Everton didn't press at all. They were really, really, really poor. They didn't. They, it was a bit of a gift, really, because the the scoreline looked like Everton put a little bit of a fight into the game, but not at all. They we we dominated. So it was a shame, obviously, to end it in a two-one because the last twenty minutes were nerve-wracking. Um, but. Other than that, I thought Bravo played well, but he's, uh, there's, there's always something in a game that somebody will be able to criticise Bravo on, and that was obviously the pass that caused their goal. But the thing is, is that that happened, but we've just been talking about our number one keeper, uh, mm. what, the Wolves. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Edison, Edison doesn't get loads of stick and loads of grief for, because let's face it, I reckon that game, we were 2 0 up. I reckon if we had 11 men on the pitch, Wolves want to beat us that night. Um, yeah. So Edison sort of gets away with, you know, too much grief, uh, in my opinion. And yet Bravo, he kicked that ball out. Granted, wasn't the best of balls, but it wasn't like it was a first-time shot from the edge of the area and they scored. 
Moise Keane picks the ball up and still beats two City players without mm. a tackle. So, yeah. it was a shame because, you know, I, I just think it just seems to always happen to him. Bravo. Um, Chris, what were your thoughts on the tackle by Calvert-Lewin towards the end? How that isn't a red card, I'll never know. Um, I don't, well, you know, you can, we can criticise VAR about lots of different things, you know. But surely someone has to upstairs be watching that and thinking, that's a leg-breaking challenge. Both feet off the floor, you know. Not going for the ball either. Nowhere near the ball. Um, should have gone. It was a disgusting challenge. Well, it was right in front of me. Uh, I was literally, it was right in front of me. I was on the second tier, right in the corner. And, and he just came flight. And straight away when he went in, I just stood up and went two feet off the floor. Yeah. And it was like a scissor challenge through the back of him. Yeah. Um, and you're just thinking, oh, is that not a red card? Surely that's got to be reviewed. Well, you know, if... I'm, not, I'm not one for wanting to get players sent off and things like that. I'm just thinking, if that would have been the other way around, if that would have been at Goodison and that was Fernandinho doing that, what are the chances Fernandinho would have been sent off? Well, definitely. Very, very high. What if that was he did that against Salah? Do you know? Oh, God. You know, definitely gone. Well, you know, I mean, yeah. petitions would be out and he'd be... <laughs> back Candles would be lit. And, oh, God, it'd be unbelievable. But Pep said it was a red. Carlo Ancelotti says, oh, I don't believe Pep thinks it's a red. I think Pep definitely thought it was a red by his reaction because on the sideline, I think he was, he was going mental at uh, the fourth official. But anyway... He broke his leg, couldn't he? He could have oh, broke yeah, his I mean, leg. Well, it, it, it's Achilles. He could have caught... You know, he got anything. He's crucial. <laughs> I mean, it's just a, it was just, for me, a clear and obvious dangerous tackle. Uh, and he wasn't in control of his body. Yeah, absolutely. But we got, we got the win. Um, VAR we're going to come on to shortly. Uh, so we'll leave the rest of the game, the contentious stuff with VAR and the poster in the stand and the, the incidents that went <laughs> in the first half. But, I mean, that's, um, you know, when, where, where we go from. I, I mean, if we go back to... Uh, the Newcastle game that was back on the 30th of November, uh, where we drew 2 2. We beat Burnley away 4 uh, 1. Granted, we got beat against United where we weren't great, but then we beat Arsenal 3 0. We beat Leicester 3 1. We've just discussed that Wolves game down to 10 men. We beat Sheffield United and we beat Everton. So, um, are we on a little bit of a run, Tom? Well, I hope we are. It'd be nice to get a nice bit of a run going. Obviously, there's some very important games coming up in January. We've obviously got the United two legs. It'd be nice to get a good win in that. And obviously, in the Premier League as well, get the get the run going. Keep winning, keep winning, keep winning. And then do try and put a little bit of pressure on Liverpool to make sure they keep winning and just see how it goes. Because if we keep winning, the gap stays the same. And then it'd be to Liverpool to make the gap smaller. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where, uh, last time I looked, I don't know whether you guys have got it up as the time we're recording this podcast, but uh, um, I think Liverpool were winning, What? yeah, they're still winning 1-0. Yeah. Um, it was interesting, I uh, saw their cross come across, it wasn't offside, but it was close enough, VAR didn't even bother reviewing it, are you surprised? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just being a bitter old man, <laughs> uh, but anyway... Um, so that's a quick review of, uh, we're not going to labour the fact, we've seen the games, there's been loads of them, we've got Port Vale coming up on Saturday, uh, and then we've obviously got um, the United games and everything else, which we'll do another podcast on after those games. But on to, uh, on to January, well we're, we're now in January, the signs are looking good for Aimer at Laporte, uh, back training and uh, Pep's hopeful that he's ahead of his schedule. We've still heard nothing about Leroy Sane and how far he is into his um, rehabilitation, let's call it. Um, do you think then, I'll come to you, Chris, first. Do you think, um, one, do you think City need a signing or two in the January transfer window? Um, and if so, who and who might have to go? Uh, I don't think uh, the position that we're in the league and everything... And with Laporte coming back, uh, we'll have to give him a little bit of time to sort of regain that form. But um, I'm, not, I'm not bothered if we don't sign anybody. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to see like Howard Bellis and Garcia given a chance. 
I'd like to see Gabby get some more minutes and Foden, you know, any, uh, you know, just some of these young kids and just see if they can do it at the top level. This is an ideal opportunity, really. Um, Pep says we're not getting anybody. I think the only thing that could happen, I suppose, is if Sane does get sold, but that's looking less remote, isn't it? So, I mean, I uh, think it's not even back in full training yet. Would you would you sign somebody, and uh, as in sign somebody to leave in January? You, you he's still not even still not even completed his rehabilitation, so you you don't even know what he's going to be like in his his first match or his whatever match he plays in. So. And if you're going to spend 80, 90 million quid on him, that's a lot of money for somebody who's injured. And, yeah. You know, I don't I don't know. I'd, I'd be surprised if Sane does go. Uh, I, don't, I think he'll go in the summer, if I'm being honest. But um, I th- I'm hopeful we, we might get him back for the for the Champions League. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be good to have Sane back playing for us. You know, it'd be great if he could commit to the club. Because I think he's a... Well, he's the, the player I love watching the most when he's on form. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but we'll see. If he's out set on going back to Germany, then there's not a lot we can do about it, you know. Now, Tom, what are your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I think after we've seen the emergence of uh, Eric Garcia lately, um, with the likes of Laporte back, I mean, obviously centre-back was a position. City fans mm-hmm. have been saying, oh, you know, we should have we bought in the summer and we need some cover there, and well, we've got Garcia there now. He's done really, really well. We, we've got Howard Bellis, and we've got Laporte coming back. Is there another position on the pitch that you think maybe we we should be looking at signing somebody, or are you similar to Chris and thinking that don't think he'll sign anyone till the summer? Well, if you'd have asked me a few weeks ago, I'd have said definitely get a centre back in. But looking at Garcia's performances and obviously Bellis in the in the cups. I don't think we need to get anybody in. It'd be just a waste of money, and like Chris said earlier, it's saving us eighty million, which yeah. is which is which is good. In the summer, I'd like to see maybe another striker come in because obviously Sergio will probably be one of his last seasons. So yeah. you know, just try and get people in that we need, and not just pointless buys such as the Cancelo buy, etc. Yeah, well. <laughs> I, I, like I said, uh, I've got nothing against Cancelo whatsoever. No. Uh, I think I, I didn't get the signing. I understand the Otamendi thing was a big part because he, he he refused to go or it didn't happen for him. So we were sort of stuck there, and Danilo wanted to go and things like that. So I understand the whole back back ball, back room sort of process where centre back time <laughs> fell down. We ended up going with Cancelo and things like that. But uh, I, you know what, I I I I'm probably in. The same thing as you, Tom. Is like a few weeks ago, I was thinking, God, we, God, we need to get. I don't know who mm-hmm. we're going to get because it's always a bad window. I was thinking Nathan Ake, but he's been injured and not coming back for another week or two. And and now I'm thinking, Gas, he's really stepped up. Uh, he's really took his opportunity. And yeah, maybe it will save us 80 million quid and that money can go elsewhere. So, all right, then I'll give you both of you, and I want names. Um, you can have two signings each for the summer um, priorities. And uh, if you can't give a name, don't give a name. But if you've got a player in mind, let me know. So, uh, Chris? How much money if, have we got, Andy? Well, yeah. you, you know, we can, we can, we can well, we, we're going to get, we're possibly going to get 80 million for uh, Leroy Sane. And we know that there could be 200 million plus available uh, if, if absolutely needed. Uh, but I don't think I don't think the board would want to you know, pay, spend that type of money if possible. But yeah. let, let let's go for a couple of hundred million quid. Let's say mm. if we could have another fifty million, Andy, well, uh, yeah. stick it all on Mbappe. Yeah, uh, mm. but uh, e- even that might not be enough to get the. Lab, no. but, um, <clears throat> I quite like the idea of uh, if we need a centre back, uh, Ruben Diaz would be my uh, go to one there. Um, and uh, we do need another striker, but I haven't really got anybody in mind. Yeah. What about Martinez from Inter Milan? Well, yeah, a lot of people are talking about him, aren't they? Um, I haven't seen. I haven't seen. I've seen. I've seen quite a bit of him. He's a top class player. Yeah, um, like like Aguero. Yeah, they say. Don't yeah, they? City have been sniffing around him now for a number of months, um, and by all accounts, there has been. 
unofficial talks, um, well, whether that's for the summer, or I can't see Inter Milan letting him go in January. Uh, no. Whether we can whether we can get him in January, keep him as part of the deal, keep him at Inter Milan, and then he comes in the summer. Uh, he sounds like a sounds like a, a perfect sort of young, you know, replacement. <laughs> In the future for uh, Aguero, uh, but well, uh, it might be that we could chuck like a couple of players in their yeah, direction yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. It, no? Yeah, you know, if Cancelo is unhappy like he claims, maybe maybe Cancelo softens the deal. Uh, yeah. He goes to so back then... to Italy, um, albeit with Inter rather than Juventus. Uh, okay, we, I think we'd all like it. we'd love Mbappe. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I still think Real Madrid are going to do everything they can to get him. But uh, Tom. Well, firstly, definitely, I'd like to see Kuda Bali come in from Napoli. Oh, he's the you're o- another Kuda Bali fan. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the only player or defender that I've seen keep Salah, Firmino, and Mane quiet in two games. And if he can do it against them, he can do it against the majority of Europe. Um, it'd be nice to see that. And then also a striker. Uh, some people might be surprised by this one, uh, but Aubameyang from Arsenal. I yeah. really think, yeah, I really think we should go for him. He's not fully happy at Arsenal. He's not he's not getting the results he wants. He wants Champions League football. So whilst he's unhappy, why don't we try and put, I don't know, maybe 70, 80, even 90 million from the Sane deal and try and get another world-class striker who I'm sure would bang in the goals for us week in, week out. Why, 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 don't, we, why don't we get Franny Lee out of retirement? You <laughs> seem to like your old players. Yeah. I heard though that he's got one year left on his contract, the Bamian. I'm sure yeah. that's what I've heard. Yeah. And and he has asked to leave. So yeah, know. I mean, I mean, with there's no doubt in his talent. Uh, for, for me, I think maybe two three years ago was the time we should have got somebody like him with uh, his age. But uh, he, he knows where to find the. He knows he knows where to uh, find the net. There's no doubt in about that whatsoever. Um, two interesting shouts. My only thing with Kudibali is is I just think he's he's too old uh, and. His buyout's too big. Uh, mm-hmm. That's that's the only downside for me. Uh, if, it, if if we could get him for like 60, 70 million quid uh, and he was maybe a year or two younger. And that's not to say that, you know, as a centre-back, you can't play 32, 33 still brilliantly. I just don't know whether it fits the model of the, the club anymore. Um, I think they're very keen on getting young players at the right price and We've we've seen it. They've they've been very stubborn about not releasing the funds to Pep. You know, we saw it last summer with Maguire. They just went, nope, no chance. Mm. We're, not, we're not doing it. So, the well, United fans are pulling their hair out with Maguire. Oh, God, did you see that montage on social media on Twitter? <laughs> no, I want. I watched one something where someone asked for a refund on him. Yeah. And said they should have kept small in. Said you know. Yeah. Oh, Jones. So another yeah. another bullet dodged there. Yeah, may, like. may, well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe he would have been brilliant for City, who knows. But anyway, moving on there, that's sort of six months down the line. Um, I think both of us, all of us agree, we're, we're not sure whether we're going to actually sign anyone in January. So moving on to uh, the uh, elephant in the room, which is uh, VAR. Uh, uh, I, you know, I do give up. Um, I understand the process. I understand why it's been brought in etc etc but you know yesterday's game really sort of it hammered it home again you know the first goal uh, uh phil foden's goal ruled out but took like th- over three minutes for it to be decided and yet we had other incidents in the game the second var one with the the mares one where mares was flagged offside and yet the var was looking at whether it was a penalty or not and you're thinking, well, it can't be a penalty if you've already flagged him offside. He's either offside, which you you must then think, oh well, he was onside. Well, he wasn't. He was he was about three yards offside. Um, it, I don't know, Tom. What are your thoughts? You were at the game yesterday, mate. Yeah, yeah. I was. Well, the the Mares incident happened right in front because we sit south stand level three, right behind the goal, so we could see it. And um, Obviously, I think it turns out that Mares actually wasn't offside. Um, he wasn't offside. No, no, he wasn't. no from offside. no from pictures I've seen on on the internet, uh, oh. he he wasn't offside. He was on, and um, I was in line with it, and he looked offside to me. But I mean, I haven't seen any replays, so yeah, I can take your word for that. Yeah, so he was onside, and he, he looks like there was a bit of contact with the defender. He, he brings him back, but I don't think he was enough for a penalty, but. 
in that situation, Mares, the whistle went and Mares sort of stopped. Yeah. So because of that, it sort of affected the play in a way. Yeah. So I, I personally think that, well, it was given as an offside free kick, but I think it should have just been given back as a drop ball. Um, I think it's all a bit messed up, really, VAR. Well, the thing is, is like, as, as, as we're, we're discussing it now, um, mm. in the ground, Yeah. in the ground, he was flagged. Yeah. Then there's a VAR. Now, the VAR said checking for a penalty. At no point was there a check to say, well, that was a clear and obvious error on the offside then if you're saying he was onside. Yeah, yeah. I know. We, we only see checking for a penalty. I know. You'll agree with me, Andy. It was, it was complete mayhem in the ground. Everybody was so confused at what was going on. They just wanted to watch the game, really. Yeah. And then for them to add two minutes at the end of the first, first half. half was ridiculous. Yeah. Chris? Uh, well, I think if you asked any football fan from any any English side, anyway, I think you'd look at probably 90% of them would want rid of VAR. Yeah. But our, our opinions don't matter to any a jot, do they? It's, and, not, uh, it's not going anywhere. No, it's not going anywhere. Um, and it needs sorting out because th- this armpit offside crap, you know, that that is just, you know, when they used to show, before this season, a player was judged offside by where his feet were. Yeah. You know, what? The, and we all knew that. So why didn't they just stick to it? Because we we knew where we stood with that. It's, it's rubbish inside the ground. It ruins the whole, you know, being able to celebrate a goal. You know, I know you, we could score a goal in the offside flags up and we're celebrating and see the flag, but it's not like that. It's it's far worse. Uh, and the the fans who go to the games, you know, they're the ones who have been disadvantaged the most. It, it's crap. Yeah. It's well, I mean, crap. the fact is, is that you know straight away when something happens, your first reaction is you're looking at the ref. You're looking at the screen in the stadium. You're thinking... Is he going to put the big sort of TV sign out? Is he going to... You just don't know what's about to happen. So you're sort of... You're trying to celebrate, but you're also immediately thinking, don't celebrate too much. I need to look at the ref because I need to check. I need to see was... was and it's just thinking, that's that's not what football's about. No, and I heard somebody on the radio saying, you know, if it's given as a goal, then you get the chance to celebrate a second time. But you don't celebrate yeah. properly the first time, yeah. do you? So, well, all, all you're doing is when it's given as a goal, you're just going, yay, because it's VAR. Yeah. And mm-hmm. You don't really celebrate it like, like you would do if it was, you know, just yeah. given. And there were lots of, I mean, I filmed it for the vlog and there was a lot of... <laughs> um, FVAR and all that type of thing that everyone was going on. And I think people are just, they are getting really fed up with it. I mean, to the point of yesterday in the ground, I'm sure you've seen it on social media, um, there was a guy who took his own little rolled up banner, uh, mm. put it put it up uh, at half time. Uh, it, I didn't have any swear words on it. Uh, it basically was sort of saying, you know, VAR's ruining football, you know, and it should there be a ban, uh, should there be a protest. And uh, next minute, there's five, six stewards around him telling him to put it down and this, that and the other. And City had come out with a, a statement saying it was because people were complaining that they couldn't see the pitch. But it was at <laughs> half time. Mm, ridiculous. And, it ridiculous. Was, and, and Martin was there. Martin was right by it and saw it and said everyone around was basically telling the stewards where to go, you know, and leave him alone. Blah, 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 blah. And that... I'm hoping for, this was in Simon Bajowski's uh, MEN article today, so that's only coming from what he's, he has said. I don't know the official line of City, but if that really has happened, uh, and City are the ones who have asked him to remove that, whether that be via the Premier League or whatever, I think it's really poor. And it, what it's just another attempt to remove the voice of the average fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it's not it's not like City don't have banners up. You know that, that cover the you know the viewing area for some fans. You know I've been in with the uh, disabled section before when they've unfurled a banner and not been able to see the first minute of a game because oh, the banner's yeah. still hanging up. You know so you know <laughs> double standards or what? Of course, oh, yeah. it's, nothing, it's nothing to do with it, is it? It's just, yeah. just it's the, they, they don't want controversy. Um, well, 
But it's not exclusive to Man City. This is a, a national problem. Yes. There, there can't be any set of fans other than maybe Liverpool, right, who, <laughs> who, who, who are enjoying VAR. Well, I mean, I'm sure if you ask most sensible Liverpool fans, yeah, yeah. They, they would go, it's absolute nonsense. Yeah. As in, in its current format. And I know people say, no, VAR's all right, it's the rules and it's this. But what makes me laugh is the fact of, you know, IFAB have even come out this week and said, the only reason it should go to VAR is if it's absolutely clear and obvious mistake that's occurred. And that's not what's happening. It's It's like... The refs are afraid to stick by their decisions. Mm. They're going to VAR. VAR are directing them as to what it is. And it's like this big get out that, well, don't blame me. I'm just the referee. Yeah. Somebody's seen, yeah. you know, 200 miles away at Stockley Park. It's is not, it clear I, and obvious, though, for offsides? I think well, offsides. Well, 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 yeah. said, well, there you go. Is it clear and obvious? I said I thought I, I was pretty much in line with the Mares one yesterday. And he looked offside to me. You've seen it on TV in the replays, and, and you're saying, no, 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 it's shown he was onside. So the ref, the linesman, he was five, six yards away from it, flagged him offside. Mm. So yeah. is, is that a clear and obvious error? Because I thought, yeah, I thought he was possibly offside, or whoever crossed the ball, whoever was offside. But, you know, so we just don't know anymore. We but have how, but absolutely it, no idea. Like you say, yes, they really does bring into question, like the Calvert Lewin. Tackle, well, foul, well, and the Foden penalty that wasn't even looked at. You know, it's well. It's, there's, 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 well, it, well. Let's take the Phil Foden one for example. Now, running through, you've got all the players, all the players up in arms. You've got the fans up mm. in arms. You've got everything else up in arms. Surely VAR would look at that and say, "Please well, not give it as a penalty." Let's just quickly review this. Take a look at it. Now, if VAR can't go in the earpiece of the referee and say, "You made a bit of a cock up there," he never, he, um, he never touched the ball. He touched Foden. It's a, it's a clear and obvious error. It's a penalty. What's wrong with that? Why, why don't they do that? I don't know. I have no <laughs> it, idea. You know, it, it, it's that's what, what's so infuriating about it. Is like you say, there's a clear and obvious mistake happened. Nothing happens. You just sort of, you know. And I think for, like I said, mate, the people who go to the games and you're in that ground, you haven't got a bloody clue what's going on, and it just builds frustration. Yeah, yeah. You know? I, think there's, I think there's some rule, isn't there, about uh, it has to be out of play before they're allowed to communicate or something. If 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 a decision like that is like, well, look at the foul, Foden should have had a penalty. Why can't they? stop play and then continue it afterwards if there's there's nothing wrong with it. It's just because they want to continue the game. Well, wait until it gets put out for a throw-in or out of play. It's just going to hold up the game even more. But then, you know, rugby referees allow mm. the game to, to yeah, go. And and we'll say, just check that for me. And they carry on, you know. Why, exactly. can't, yeah. why can't football yeah. do it? Obviously, yeah. 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 Well, I think it's something we're going to be... I can't see there being any quickness to it um, unless they change some of the rules. But then again, I think there's been 20 rule changes since its introduction um, and nothing seems to be getting any better. So, uh, well, part VAR, it's just going to go on and on and on and, and probably run right the way through the summer at Euro 2020 and everything else. But uh, moving on, uh, last couple of things, I'm going to look at the team. City team in a decade, see who you guys have got in yours, uh, and then you've got the golden question. So, I'm gonna come to Tom first. So, would you, so you like me to, to, would you like you, me to give you it? You can have whatever formation you want, mate, um, to get players in. And it's, I, I did mine earlier today and just was like, oh god, how can I leave him out? I, I can't. <laughs> what about, it? yeah, I know that's close, and he's probably not the best player, but I thought he was, oh, it was a nightmare. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll all disagree with it. But anyway, go we with... Go, are we going through like go, place by place and giving the opinions or just the whole thing first? No, we'll go through goalkeeper. We're not oh, okay, through. cool. So if you, if cool. You, the only problem being is we might have different formations, but uh, yeah. what formation did you go for? I went for a 4 one 3 2 formation. Okay, that's going to complicate things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've got a 4-4-2 and a 4-3-3, so... Okay. Well, I've gone for a four four two, so I could squeak, sort of get players in. But um, right, I tell you what, then rather than just go keep a uh, player for player, Tom, give me your four two three one 
six five seven <laughs> formation. I can make it easier and just call it four four two. I guess. Do, do, I do it however you want, mate. So I've got Joey Joe Art in goal. I think he's been the the player, for the keeper of the decade for me. Okay. Um, Pablo, uh, Vinny, Les Scott, and Kolarov as the back four. Um, De Jong as the CDM, and then as the three in front of him, De Bruyne, Torre, and David Silva, and then the two strikers, Aguero and Jeko. Just go through that lineup again. How many players have you got in your team? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, eleven. There's oh, eleven. Okay. Yeah. Who've I missed there? Okay. No problem. So just quickly run through again. Who've you got? Joe so Hart. Jo Joe Hart in goal, yeah. Zabaleta, Vincent Company, Jolly and Lescott, yeah. and Alexander Kolarov. Okay. Uh the CDM, Nigel De Jong, and yeah. uh, the three in midfield just in front of him, Kevin, Yaya, and David Silva, and then the two strikers, Sergio and Jacko. So no room for Fernandinho. No, he's on the bench. <laughs> okay, right, good team. Um, Chris? Mm. Well, I've got Edison in goal, and I agree that, you know, Joe Hart's been there a lot longer, and he did really well at City until Pep came and he couldn't adapt to his style. So that that was a tough one. And another one I disagreed with was Kolarov. I went for Clichy. I think that I think our left-back is our weakest uh, yeah. Uh, 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 position. Um, I got Laporte and company is my back centre backs with Zabs, and then I've got uh, Fernandinho, Yaya, KDB, David, Aguero, and Tevez. That's my four four two. Yes, it's, it is so difficult, guys. It really, really is. And they would. I, I was. I, I changed it about five times. <laughs> and I could have put. I could have put any one of four or five in different positions. Uh, for what it's worth, I really tossed up between Joe Hart and Edison, but I just think because of what Edison's brought lately, I just think he's changed the dynamic of goalkeeping uh, in this country. And I, I just, I, I don't know how, and I'll probably get screamed at. Uh, but I went for Edison. Um, Zaba, I think we've all got Zaba. Company, I think we've all got company. I actually put Laporte in there, and I did. I went with you, Tom. I yeah. did, did toss up with Les Scott, and I was like, oh because he had such a good partnership. But I went for Laporte because of just just maybe because of his technical ability. Um, and again, left back, I was tossing up. I was tossing. You know what? I was even to I was even tossed up with having James Milner. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. Yeah. You know. Um, but I went for Kolarov, um, yeah. even though I, gave, I, I was one who gave him a load of grief. And I tossed up between Clichy and Kolarov, and I, I sort of went for Kolarov. I don't know why. Um I've gone with uh, a four-four-two. So the two sort of inside uh, cent centre midfielders. I went with you, uh, Chris. I went for Ferner and Yaya Torre, and then ahead of them, same as you, Kevin De Bruyne and David Silva. <coughs> Aguero obviously is in there, but then I just was again tossing up between Tevez. I absolutely loved. Jacko, I absolutely loved. And for what he did and that goal, just he deserves to be in there. But I haven't. I've gone for Raheem Sterling. Mm -hmm. I've gone for Aguero and Sterling up front. He was, it, he was in my four-three-three. Three. Yeah, I just I I, I, I I was desperate for Tevez and Aguero, but then I was thinking, oh, Jacko was ju he was just a legend. Mm. Um, but then I had to. I don't know. Maybe I might swap them back. I don't know. <laughs> I went for Sterling only because I just think his goals he scored this season have been even mm. though he's not been at his best. But the the last year and the year before, I thought he was absolutely superb. Um, and they were two seasons where we had the Centurions and we had the, the 98 points in the Formidables last year, hence why he just got in for me. But another, another shouts out, I had Nigel De Jong there. I had Gareth mm. Barry as well. Yeah, that's a buzzer, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so, really difficult one. It is what it is. Everyone will disagree. Be screaming at this podcast now going... Yeah. I'll be put collar off as left back. He was garbage. Um, Better than Mendy. <laughs> uh, maybe Mendy will go on in, in due course, but uh, yeah, no Wilf Bonny either. No oh. Wilf Bonny. Yeah, where well, what's going on there? Scott uh, Sinclair. We could have had him in there. Could have asked. Yes, yeah, Scott Sinclair in there. Jack well. Rodwell. We could have a full team. Oh, oh god! If only that's what, that would have been a good team to done. Your worst eleven. The worst eleven. The worst eleven of the decade. I think that would have been easier. 
Yeah, it probably yeah, would have been. Yeah, yeah. It probably would have been. Because we have plenty to choose from. Yeah. Um, anyway, listen, thanks for that. Right, last one, uh, golden question. So, uh, Chris, you, over to you. You can ask Tom one question. You can ask me one question. Well, I'll ask you both, right? And it yeah. is, um, what was your favourite game of the last decade? Oh, wow. oh that's, a, that's a really hard one. That is a really hard one. Oh, I don't want to be obviously. I'd, I'd, I'm going to. I'm not. Answer, I'm not, not, really. I'm not going to say ninety three. I'm not going to say ninety three twenty because it's too obvious. Yeah, uh, I agree. And, and it would I be ninety three twenty. And I you can't have enjoyed that game until the very last minute. No, anyway. no, no. I didn't. Oh. Enjoy, hey, listen. Uh, no, I won't even say what I was going to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, it's going to go down as the, probably the greatest game in Premier League history, but. Uh, I don't know. Over to you, Tom. Uh, for me personally, it was the first time I'd ever been to Wembley, and it has to be the Ayatore goal against United. Yeah, it was the first sort of chance where we were the nosy neighbours were here to stay, sort of thing. It was just a great atmosphere and a great feeling that we'd finally beaten United and had our first chance of silverware in over thirty-five years. Yeah. So yeah, so that was that was definitely other than the ninety-three twenty one to remember for me. God, yeah. There's so many. Um, if I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna go a bit left field here, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for. Let's forget ninety three twenty, and I'll have to forget that semi final, um, the United and um, semi final, and um, you know what I'm gonna go for? I'm, I'm thinking of moments, and I'm thinking about moments how it made me feel walking out mm. the ground. Mm. And it was, and it they weren't. The, well, one of them wasn't the best game, but it was one of the best moments I I've had as a City fan, excluding those games and and the five one at Main Road and everything else and Gillingham and whatever, was Vincent Company's goal against Leicester mm. <laughs> from 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 pure emotion, but probably the the best game from an atmosphere point of view and on the edge of my seat and everything else. I'm gonna go. Apart from the others I've mentioned, I'm going to go the three, the um, the uh, um, Spurs game when we got knocked out of the Champions League. It yeah, hey, it was an unbelievable atmosphere, wasn't it? The yeah. atmosphere was absolutely incredible. The game was incredible. Mm. And I walked out of there, even though we got knocked out, and just thinking, what a game of football I've just witnessed. That was mm. just unbelievable. So for me... He's, he's not up there with the city stuff that, but but Vinny's that that goal from Vinny just sent shivers down my spine and, but that, I, I, I'm gonna go for that defeat against Spurs. I know mm-hmm. it's really weird, but apart from the obvious obvious ones and things like that. So uh, yeah, yeah. that be mine. Yeah. yeah. Right. Good question. <sighs> Difficult one. Um, yeah. Tom. So mine's mine's sort of similar to Chris's in a in a way. What is the what's your best trophy? Uh, what is the your most favourite trophy winning? Trophy out of this decade. Uh, for me, it's the first Premier League title. Because mm. um, I, I, you know, I'm I'm approaching fifty, right? And for most of my life, I didn't think I'd see City win anything. Yeah. Um, and then when we won the FA Cup, that was fantastic. You know, absolutely fantastic, wonderful stuff. But to win the league, um, and everything that sort of the whole emotion of that. Was incredible, um, you know. I, I'm gonna lie. I was very drunk and uh, quite emotional. Um, just amazing. And we were talking about the team of the decade, you know. And I know most people are gonna think I'm mad now, right? But I would have Mancini as our manager, you yeah, know, of that, that team. Chris, that's exactly who I put as the team of the decade manager. Yeah, I completely I, agree. I love Mancini and you, the players he brought in. You know, we still have some of them as the backbone of the team. You know, they they have been sensational buys, and uh, and he changed the whole ethos of our club. So yeah, the first uh, Premier League trophy is the the one trophy that I'll you know, were just amazing emotions. Yeah, for me, same 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 reason. Uh, I'll, I'll be fifty in three months' time, and I honestly never thought I'd see in my lifetime was lifting the Premier League trophy. Um, and and the way that we did it uh, is just yeah, nearly killed me that day. Um, 
I didn't think I'd ever reach 50 after that day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it has to be. It has to, it has to go down. That, that's got to be the one. Um, though, the, Gab, the, Gabby, the Gabby goal for, for, for the 100 points... That that was because that was that was last seconds. Mm. Uh, that was special, but no, it's got to be the night ninety three twenty moment. It's got to be the mm. the best one, yeah, for me mm. too. Um, right. Uh, well, I've asked you loads of questions, so I'm not asking the golden question. It only comes from the guests. So, uh, guys, listen. Uh, I just want to say a massive thank you for coming on podcast ten, uh, episode Thanks. ten, and uh, thank you for all your answers. Uh, and thanks for the questions as well. So, uh, anything last you want to say, Chris? Uh, no, just happy New Year to you two and to everyone else who's uh, uh, taking the you know time to listen to us, and uh, happy Blue Year. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Yes, following from Chris, there. Happy New Year to everybody who's watching and you two as well. Um, let's hope for a great season, lads. Let's get uh, some trophies and not get disheartened about the league. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Um, can't win it every year. Back to back to back trebles. Uh, back to back to back titles is only United have done it in the modern era. So uh, that's how difficult it is. But we're still in the Champions League against Real Madrid. We'll be doing a podcast and everything else. So we'll come on, get you on the podcast and talk about the Champions League nearer the time. But anyway, this is Andy from Man City Fan TV. Again, I want to say a massive thank you to Chris and Tom for coming on and uh, giving us uh, their time. So uh, it's really appreciated. Don't forget, uh, you can get this podcast and you can download it and listen to it for free uh, on SoundCloud as well. Uh, so if you don't want to watch it via YouTube, you want to go for a run or jog or walk or whatever else that you're doing, you can listen to it uh, over there. So go over and check it out on that particular um, piece of software. But anyway... Take care, keep subscribing, hit the bell icon. And again, I want to say a massive thank you to the guys and also a big happy new year and 2020 to all the Man City fans out there. Take care, we'll see you soon. <laughs>